So in this video, I'm going to just highlight uh, some of the uh, key uh, parts of the story that is found uh, in the book of Genesis, and story uh, about the book of Genesis. So uh, we'll begin here, first of all, by noting that the name Genesis um, comes from a Greek word. It might be kind of a surprise for, for some, since this is the Old Testament book, and people think of the Old Testament, they think of, of the Hebrew language, but uh, our English title for this uh, this work is based off of the uh, Greek uh, title or the Greek way of just des of describing or referencing this work. So when I say Greek, I'm referring to the Septuagint, the Greek translation of many of the uh, Old Testament uh, books. Uh, and so uh, this word Genesis uh, from this Greek word has the idea of origin. So this book is about the origin, not only of creation itself, but also, um, you know, the key issue for the, its author, the origin of a particular people uh, who have this relationship with the uh, creator. And so it tells the story of, or the account of, of the origin of God's covenant people. This is the descendants of Jacob. So there's going to be a key character in the book of Genesis called Abraham. Uh, and he's going to have a son named Isaac. Um, he does have another son, um, but um, it's going to focus on Isaac. And then not only uh, Isaac has two sons, uh, but it's going to focus then on one of his sons, Jacob. And so uh, what comes to be known or thought of as the Israelites are going to be descendants of Jacob through Isaac, through Abraham. Uh, theories about the time of its composition does range from Moses, if Moses is somehow or another responsible for uh, its content, um, you know, at least part, maybe not the final composition, but uh, was he responsible for uh, putting together uh, parts of this uh, material? Uh, that would date it to um, way back to the 15th century B.C., um, but uh, other scholars think, no, this whole composition, this whole putting together is pulling in all these different traditions, uh, this, these different stories that have been written uh, much later than the time of Moses, and was finally composed, finally put together some somewhere around the 4th century B.C., or after the time that uh, those uh, Judeans who had been taken into exile by the Babylonians, are, are returning. Uh, some scholars believe that portions of Genesis, uh, primarily those stories about um, creation of the world uh, and the creation of humans that we find in just the first couple of chapters, have their origin in Babylonian mythology. So, you know, the um, Judeans had been taken into Babylonian captivity, so they were exposed to Babylonian mythology, uh, and they you know, use that mythology in order to construct their own a story or account of, of how God started, uh, started the world, started human beings. So Genesis um, covers two large periods of time. It's going to cover, in chapters 1 through 11, it's going to cover the early Bronze, bronze Age, so that's the time up until 2000 BC. And then from chapters 12 through 50, it's going to cover what often referred to as the middle Bronze I and Bronze IIa period. So that's around 2000 to 1750 BC. Uh, Yahweh uh, is uh, the name of, of the god who is responsible for creation um, of the universe and creation of humans and is the one who is going to um, uh, interact with Abraham and his descendants, um, uh, especially the descendants through Jacob. Uh, and they are the central characters of, of the narrative in Genesis. So Yahweh, Abraham, and Jacob are these three central characters in the book of Genesis. Um, what is theologically core in the narrative is what's known as the Abrahamic covenant. You'll 
find this in Genesis 15.7. And I put Genesis 15.7 uh, up as well. And this is a passage of scripture that I uh, really want uh, students to be able to associate with Genesis. So 15.7 says, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans. So Ur is an area or region in what would be present day um, uh, Iraq. So from that area, um, from the Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land, referring to the land of Palestine, to possess. Um, and then we see in Genesis 15, um, 18 to 21, uh, where he talks about to your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt. Not quite sure uh, which river it's referring to, referring to the Nile or if it's referring to something else, but from the great river to, to the great river. So um, the uh, rivers that are running through what would be present day I I Iraq or in the areas of Babylon, uh, the, the river Euphrates. So that, the, that is the great river. So uh, it's this promise that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or particularly through Jacob, are given uh, this, are promised this land. So this is part of this covenant relationship that God is going to have with Abraham and these descendants, that he is the creator of, of worlds. Uh, he's the creator of this earth. He's the creator of them. He's the creator of all people. Uh, and he is going to give these descendants uh, the possession of this land. So the structure of Genesis can be divided into four major parts. Um, there is the origins of the heaven and the earth, kind of chapter one, chapter two, the origins of humanity and, and their pattern of rebellion against God. So we get chapter three, uh, this kind of rebellion with the first created couple. Um, and what they do is really a pattern of other rebellions. So rebellions of, that has to do with, um, you know, Cain, uh, Adam and Eve's, one of Adam and Eve's children who kills his brother, uh, and then other um, humans who will engage in other crimes against humanities or other violent acts against humanity. Uh, it's also uh, ordered around the origins of the 12 tribes of Israel. So, uh, the name Jacob, who is this you know, grandson of Abraham, um, he is going to be given a name. He's going to be given the name Israel because he struggles uh, with God. And uh, he's going to have this, he's going to continue this covenant relationship with God through, uh, through his sons. So each, he has 12 sons, and each son basically is the head of a different tribe or a different clan or a different group. All of these trace their relationship back to um, not only Israel, but to Isaac and then to Jacob. And then the last part, the big chunk of the book of Genesis, has to do with the story of Joseph. And the reason why you have this story is because this is going to be explaining um, the people uh, being coming into Egypt, so this foreign power. Uh, in which they are going to be enslaved to. Uh, and while they are enslaved, God is still at work. Um, it may seem like while they are enslaved, God has abandoned. He's forgotten about the problems, but God hasn't. Uh, he is still there. He is uh, doing things uh, and is going to eventually bring them out of uh, captivity. So these are uh, some of the major parts or structures uh, of the book of Genesis. So the major themes that we have in here is that uh, God is uh, creator and sustainer of the universe. Um, he is not apathetic to human rebellion, to uh, his order for them in creation. So because uh, humans rebel, he then responds. He just doesn't 
you know, sit by idly and look at what's what's happening and shrug your shoulders. Um, but he takes some kind of action in response to rebellion. He initiates, particularly, the covenant relationship with Abraham. So this is a relationship that he uh, creates in order to deal with human uh, rebellion. Uh, and so this is not just through Abraham, but it's also through his uh, descendants, through Jacob. And this uh, relationship is an act of grace to all of human humans who have been rebelling against God. So to call into existence it, his relationship with this group of people is his response to that. So God is almighty. He is uh, El Shaddai, is the, kind of the Hebrew expression here for God is almighty, who appears to humans uh, and should be worshipped over other gods. So this is what um, uh, the authors of our textbook, uh, survey of the Old Testament, call that kind of a practical monotheism. Uh, by practical monotheism, um, they're suggesting the idea of, well, there, there may be these other divine beings that are out there and who are doing things, but as far as the one who should be worshipped, um, that it should be only El Shaddai, only the Almighty who created the universe and who is, um, is going to work in in the world through uh, these people, through the people, the descendants of, of Jacob. Uh, and so you recognize the existence of other gods, uh, but you're only worshiping one. You're not recognizing these other gods as ones who ought to be appeased, ought to be sacrificed to. Uh, so God is going to punish human lawlessness uh, when their sinfulness reaches its limit. So it's as if God sees human rebellion going on, and as these, he allows time for this rebellion to go on, but um, once it gets to a certain stage, a certain limit, then he's going to respond. But uh, he's going to remain faithful uh, to his covenant people. So um, even when his covenant people, are sinful and rebellion. He is going to respond uh, to that. He is, that's a part of the covenant. But he's going to remain faithful to them. In other words, he's going to keep this covenant in place even when they act as if the covenant is not in place. So that's going to take us then through uh, kind of a brief introduction to the book of, of Genesis and its themes and particular content.